Good evening. This is VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. Good evening to everybody. Trust everybody as well. <coughs> but, uh, as we come up to the end of uh, another month here on the 29th of July. 2022. We're broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kilohertz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and simulcasting on 160 meters oh, bloody camera uh, on um, the medium wave service on 1865 kilohertz in the 160 meter amateur radio band amplitude modulation 100 watts um, we're also streaming via YouTube. You can find that um, by typing in VK3CSJ on the uh, Google search engine or the YouTube, <laughs> the YouTube uh, search engine. And uh, here we are. And uh, in HD. And we've got picture back. <laughs> disappeared for a second on RTV but we are broadcasting through the Melbourne television repeater uh, VK3 RTV on channel 1 in HD and uh, I can see that now the lost the picture there for a while that's my f problem my end uh, we uh, also have a email address an active email address uh, VK3 EKH at gmail.com VK3 EKH at gmail.com and uh, you're more than welcome to send signal reports to that. We're watching the inbox as we speak. We also have a Discord uh, chat window available, uh, which can be found via the ASV website at www.asv.org.au. And uh, go across to the Radio Astronomy tab and um, look for the, ASV, the link to the ASV broadcast Friday night broadcast and there you'll see a uh, little icon with a um, radio telescope in it and uh, that is the link to the Discord channel. You can sign up anonymously and or, or with your name if you like or call sign, whatever. Um, Alright, a very pleasant good evening to Richard, VK3VRS, who's at the top of the list there on the chat window. G'day Martin, VK7JAH, down there at Lawn System. Uh, we also have Graham, VK3GRK up at Bendigo, who's tuned in to, uh, to, uh, to tonight, which I can, like I say, I can see on the chat window. All right. <laughs> That's good with it. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's going to be a short one tonight. I think I went to about an hour and a half last week, didn't I? Yeah, I won't do that tonight. The Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922. It has well over 1,700 members in its coffers scattered about the place. Membership of the Society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge of the science to provide and to provide greater facilities for members. Meet, but there are monthly meetings usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, sometimes in January, the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm in the Molia Hall, National Herbarium, Bird Avenue, Melbourne, uh, near the Melbourne Observatory, which is located adjacent to the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, which the hall is right on, uh, which is located, oh, I've already said that, Dulles Brooks Drive and surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. Meetings, like I say, meetings start right on 8 o'clock and uh, the aim is to be uh, vacating the building by 10. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at Melbourne Observatory, receipt of the ASV magazine crux containing articles, news, observing notes and the like, and the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. 
Access is available to telescopes on members nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory. And after the monthly meetings, uh, weather permitting. <coughs> These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible as well. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan so members can try before they buy. Regular Society Club Night meetings are held on the first and last Fridays of each month at the Lodge, the Society's property in Burwood. Members are encouraged to use the Society's instruments located there to gain first-hand experience in telescope use. These instruments include a 508mm equatorial reflector and a number of smaller reflectors. Members are also encouraged to take or make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, uh, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use, the, uh, the larger uh, to only with appropriate training which range from 300mm to 1000mm in aperture. Also located on site is the 8.5 fully steerable radio telescope which members can access with involvement in the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest include uh, deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral, meteor, comet, radio astronomy, computing, cosmology, astrophysics, historical studies and research and astronomy in general, in a nutshell. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook, but if you don't have access to the yearbook, uh, you can find out various link information, email information uh, via the ASV website. <clears throat> for further information, um, or further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website at www.asv.org.au <clears throat> um, and uh, the last comment here is please note that the ASV will conform to all government health directives AFC, ASV events may require to be cancelled, moved or postponed. You can write to the Secretary of the Astronomical Society of Victoria GPO Box 1059 Melbourne, Victoria 3001. But like I say, conversely, you can go to the website at www.asv.org.au and all will be revealed. And uh, if I just have a quick look at the home page on the site, uh, they're still advertising the Sea Lake AstroFest coming up on October 29 to November 1. It's, the, uh, it's a, um, um, uh, what you'd call it, an astronomical conference of some sort. Um, but it's spread out over the weekend. There'll be presentations and uh, obviously telescopes set up to view the sky. Hopefully the sky will be clear on that weekend. I think tickets have almost gone but you need to get tickets to go uh, to be able to get on to that one sea lake it's a it's about a four hour drive from here but it should be a good weekend if uh, all goes to plan but you can uh, like i say you can find out more information by going to the asv website on that one um all righty then We've got a club section meeting tonight um, between 7 and 10 p.m. So it's finished now. Club section meets are informal and they take place on the first and last Fridays of each month. And uh, uh, yeah, so, but all that can be found on the ASV website. All right, let's move along. It's quarter past the hour. Which 
trust everybody is okay. Now, <clears throat> as we come up to the beginning of August, which is Monday, Monday is the 1st of August, fortunately the planetarium has uh, sent out the sky nights nice and early. So let's go through what's happening in the sky for August. And the first thing off the top of their list is the sun rise and set times. So on Monday, the sun is rising at 7.20 in the morning. When else would it, Clint? And setting at 5.32. It's a day length of 10 hours and 11 minutes. On Thursday the 11th, the sun will rise at 7.10 and set at 5.41 with a day length of 10 hours and 30 minutes. And on Sunday the 21st of August, the sun will rise at 6.57 and set at 5.49 with the day length being 10 hours and 51 and then by the end of the month, on Wednesday the 31st, the sun rises at 6.43 and sets at 5.57 with the day length coming out to 11 hours and 13 minutes. I just realised I haven't got my studio lights on. So the day gets longer, thank goodness for that. And I'm beginning to notice that, that extra bit of daylight in the morning at 7 o'clock is good. But uh, yes, definitely getting to noticing that little bit of extra daylight in the evening hours too. Although it's still pretty dark by six. Moon phases. There is a first quarter on the 5th of August, Friday. There's a full moon on the 12th of August, which is also a Friday. And then there's a third quarter uh, on Saturday the 27th. Uh, the moon will be closest to the Earth on the 11th, Thursday the 11th of August at 359,828 kilometres. Then by the 23rd of August, Tuesday the 23rd at lunar apogee, the furthest from the Earth at 405,418 kilometres. Planets. This is VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. Mercury, which returns from its passage behind the Sun, will only be visible for a brief time around 6 pm in the west, sitting shortly before 8 pm. It will become progressively harder to spot by late August. Venus is drawing closer to the Sun but could still be seen early in the morning from 6am. But by the end of August it will no longer be visible from Melbourne as it will soon pass behind the Sun. It is the second brightest object in the night sky after the Moon, our closest sunward neighbour and thickly shrouded in a cloud that reflects sunlight. It's both the morning and evening star considered as in Sky Notes 2021, here again you can explore why in a 2020 virtual planetarium show from the Rochester Museum Science Centre and Planetarium that uses the free program's Stellarium in the Northern Hemisphere view and NASA's eyes on the solar system. There are all links in this article I'm just reading here. Virtual Planetarium, uh, Virtual Planetarium Show, NASA eyes on the solar system, there are actually links hidden within the text on Sky Notes. Mars will be visible uh, all this month as it rises about 1.30 a.m. and will last until, until lost in the north in the early dawn light. Jupiter, the third brightest object in the night sky, uh, can easily be seen for most of the night in this month rising at 10 p.m. in early August and then earlier each night until late in the month it will fade in the west in the morning light. 
if you're interested in being able to detect decametric radio emissions from the Sun or Jupiter storm activity this is probably a good time while Jupiter becomes or is a nighttime object away from the Sun uh, during the day uh, it is possible at uh, frequencies in the high part of the shortwave band anywhere between 20 or let's say 15 15 18 megs up to uh, 30 megs 40 megs uh, it is possible to detect storm activity decimet what what's referred to as decimetric emission uh, cyclotron emission from Jupiter so if you have a reasonably good sensitive uh, receiver uh, operating at say 15 meters tune away or tune from on a frequency um, that's not going to be occupied by anything and uh, of course it would be nice to have a an antenna that's pointing at Jupiter but in most cases that's that's not the case so uh, just a, a normal HF beam that's kind of favoring in in the direction of Jupiter it's better than nothing uh, and uh, find a clear frequency and see if you can hear the telltale signs of Jupiter storm activity if you don't know what to listen to in most cases <laughs> Uh, if you look for radio storm activity in fact uh, probably just go to the NASA Radio Jove website NASA sponsors Radio Jove they have uh, a collection of sound files there for short bursts long bursts and uh, there's another lot of bursts there somewhere I can't think of it now but anyway short bursts and long bursts are predominantly the the main uh, type of noise you hear and uh, so you get a bit of an idea of what to listen for always helps but there is a program that you can download free um, although if you want to pay the uh, small fee to open up the program fully you can but there's a program called um, Radio Jupiter Pro and uh, that is a prediction program uh, which helps to give you the windows of opportunity to detect these storm emissions going completely off the subject here but uh, nevertheless um, yeah so uh, Radio Sky Publishing is the website for that uh, Radio Sky Publishing and you can download an electronic chart program called Radio Sky Pipe and the prediction program and uh, they're free to download it's just the, the some of the features won't be uh, working unless you get registration keys from it and it's not expensive all good fun if you're in a quiet location it's uh, if you live in suburbia it's uh, not quite possible to hear this storm activity as I think we all appreciate living in the sub suburbs you uh, unfortunately uh, have to deal with a, uh, a band noise uh, which is generated by uh, Gunge in the suburban out outreaches outback. Anyway, um, I'm waiting for this cup of coffee to kick in, so bear with me. Jupiter, yes, we've talked about Jupiter, haven't we? Saturn. Now I've got a nice little picture of Saturn here, and I think I'll throw that up for what it's worth. Uh, this is courtesy of Sky Notes. It's a beautiful picture of Saturn. Uh, I've lost the picture from the repeater again, but I gather it's there. Um, okay, that picture you're seeing there is uh, the Hubble Space Telescope image of Saturn taken on the 6th of June 2018 with an open view of its majestic ring system. So Saturn, the second largest planet and with a faint yellowish tinge in our skies is visible in the east in the evening while well after dusk it will move higher in the north before setting in the west by 6 a.m. later in the month on the night of the 14th and 15th Saturn will reach opposition and sit directly opposite the Sun as seen from Earth a modest telescope should reveal its open rings illuminated by the Sun from early June to late October the planet is in a retrograde motion moving backwards a little each night against the background of fixed stars as viewed from Earth. In terms of planetary orbits Earth is 
the Earth in its inner lane overtakes Saturn, which moves in its much slower outer lane. Retrograde motion. It's an interesting little phenomenon, that. Um, okay, just come back to me for a second there. Uh, now, continuing on, meteors. This month, major meteor shower is the Perseids, which peaks on the 13th and the 14th. Although not strong in the Southern Hemisphere, they are fast, bright and can leave persistent trails and come from a point below the northeast horizon in the northern constellation of Persis. These meteors result from, a, from Comet Swift Tuttle which passed near the Sun in 1991, leaving a trail of particles um, for the Earth to regularly pass through. That comet went for a tuttle. <laughs> anyway, yes, so uh, that's uh, peaks on the 13th and the 14th um, Perseids meteor shower. And in watching the news tonight, I believe the uh, the uh, there is also some sort of activity tonight uh, to be seen or in the morning if the sky is clear. I'm not too sure uh, what that was, but there was some reference to a meteor shower happening this morning if you're up early enough. <sighs> Stars and constellations in the north. This month's evening skies show Virgo and Spicer, the 15th brightest star at night and 262 light years away, have moved towards the west, while Leo has largely disappeared below the northern western horizon, northwestern horizon. However, Libra uh, is high in the north and in the northeast is Aquila, uh, with its principal star, Alta the 12th brightest star at night and 17 light years from us. If you look towards the east, very high in the east after sunset and slowly moving overhead during the night as our planet rotates to the east is Scorpius with its impressive curving line of stars. The central star of the three that form the Scorpion's body is the red giant Antares and is 34 light years away and the 16th brightest star at night. Rising behind and following during the night is the Centaur Sagittarius uh, which with its bow and arrow forming the famous teapot asterism. Turning towards the south, standing high in the southwest is Crux or the Southern Cross. On a moonless night and certainly away from city lights can be seen the dark patch known as the Colsac Nebula a vast region of interstellar gas that blocks our view of more distant stars. To its left are the pointers Alpha and Beta Centauri, the brightest and second brightest stars in the constellation of Centaurus, which is the other horse-human hybrid from ancient Greek myth. Alpha Centauri is also known as the as Regal Cent uh, Centaurus with a K, uh, foot of the centaur and is the fourth brightest star in the night sky. Until recently, uh, it was thought to be our sun's nearest neighbor at 4.37 light years. Although we see although we we see one star, it uh, uh, it is in fact two, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B in close elliptical orbits around their barycentra bar or common center of mass. The pair are not unlike our Sun, one very similar and the other a little cooler and smaller. The existence of two planets, uh, one around each star, is suspected but as yet unconfirmed. Of special interest is the faint small red dwarf star Proxima Centauri, designated as Alpha Centauri C, that lies a considerable distance away, seemingly bound to others. We now understand Centauri to be a triple star system. Proxima, as the name suggests, is currently the closest star to our Sun at 4.24 light years and hosts at least two planets. Proxima Centauri b, discovered in 2016, is a little over Earth's mass, orbits swiftly much closer than Mercury does to our Sun and is presumed to be tidally locked with only one face turned to its star. 
The second planet, Proxima Centauri c, discovered in 2016, is about seven Earth masses, lies further out in a five-year orbit, and may possess a huge ring system. In 2020 and 2022, a third planet, Proxima Centauri d, became a candidate and, if confirmed, would be a quarter the size of Earth and the system's innermost planet orbiting every five days. Okay. Um, okay. Returning to our August night skies, low in the southeast is the tenth brightest star, Achena, in the constellation of Irindai, Irindai, the river, which sits at 144 light years from Earth. And in the southwest lies the second brightest star, Canopus, in the constellation of Carina, at 313 light years. From our southern latitude, both of these stars never, dis never disappear below the horizon. These two stars provide a handy example of a, large, of a key relationship in astronomy and observing the night sky. A star's apparent brightness depends not only on its distance from us, but also its luminosity, how much light it emits. Luminosity is determined by size, radius and surface temperature, both of which can change over the life of the star as it undergoes stages of stellar evolution. Canopus is almost two and a half times further from us than Achenar, but its luminosity is well over three times higher. On a league table of brightness, as observed from Earth, the energy output of Canopus easily wins over Achenar, closest, which is closest to us. To the west, low in the northwest is Arcturus, Arcturus, the third brightest star at night, and 37 light years from us in the constellation of Bootes. Corvus, Latin for cow, uh, sits squarely in the west in the evening this month. In ancient Greek mythology, however, this sacred bird is a raven that perches on the back of Hydra, the sea serpent. The serpent nearby head that the serpent's nearby head is a little higher up in the west and marks one end of a long narrow body that snakes to the horizon in the longest of traditional 88 constellations. This set of constellations was agreed upon by the International Astronomical Union IAU almost a century ago and drew heavily on European, Mediterranean or Middle Eastern traditions, sources, catalogues of the past. However, in this century, new or supplementary names for, for celestial objects, uh, as well as their stories, are increasingly being introduced from many cultures around the world to complement those already used widely in astronomy. In the same way, what oh, that that names in the same way that names and presentation is drawn from Earth cultures for many new moons, Kuiper Belt objects planetary features, exoplanets, and other discoveries being made. The International Space Station. Uh, at a distance of about 400 kilometers above the surface, the IWS completes an orbit every 90 minutes and appears as a bright object that moves slowly across the night sky. There are many visible passes accepted, uh, accepted this month over Melbourne and central Victoria. Some of the good ones are, on the morning, Sunday morning of the 7th of August, there's a passing at 6.22am to 6.29am, coming in from the southwest to the northeast. On Wednesday the 10th, uh, there is a passing at 5.36am to 539 coming in from the northwest to the northeast. In the evening of Thursday the 18th, there's a passing at 6.57pm to 7.02pm, coming in from the northwest to the southeast. And then on Friday the 19th, there's a passing at 6.08pm to 6.15pm, coming in from the north-northwest to the south-southeast, or to the east-southeast. Now, um, I know you didn't take that down, <laughs> uh, but all those passings and others can be found if you go to the Heavens Above website. I've mentioned that all the time. Heavens Above 
Earth.com gives predictions for visible passes of space stations and major satellites, live sky views and 3D visualizations. Be sure to first enter your location under the configuration tab. But yeah, heavens above is the uh, ideal place to go to for uh, finding out what's passing overhead. This is VK3EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. Coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. On this day, on the 3rd of August 2004, Messenger, the Messenger USA mission to Mercury was launched. On the 4th of August 2007, Phoenix Mars lander was launched. On the 5th of August 1998, NASA Near Earth Object Program is created to detect and catalogue asteroids that approach Earth. Also on the 5th of August 1939, first person to walk... Oh, okay. I just had to read that <laughs> before I said anything further. On the 5th of August 1939, the first person to walk on the moon. You see how I, I had to stop there. Just thought, what's going on with this sentence? <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, so I finished it, but it's, it's correct. It is correct. On the 5th of August 1939, first person to walk on the moon, American Neil Armstrong is born. That's You've got to go right to the end of the sentence. <laughs> On the 6th of August 2012, the Mars rover Curiosity lands on the Red Planet. On the 6th of August 1996, a meteorite from Mars discovered in Antarctica is said by NASA to contain possible microfossils of bacteria. On the 7th of August 1959, Discoverer 1 USA returns the first satellite images of the Earth. On the 10th of August, 1675, the Royal Greenwich Observatory is established east of London. Also on the 10th of August, 1990, Magellan, USA, arrives at Venus and begins radar mapping of the surface. On the 12th of August, 1877, astronomer Asaph Hall at the US Naval Observatory discovers Mars tracks are clearly evident 12.6 kilometer diameter moon Deimos. I'll just read that again. On the 12th of August 1877, astronomer Asif, I guess that's how you pronounce that, Asif Hall at the, uni at the US Naval Observatory discovers Mars tracks are clearly evident 12.6 kilometer diameter moon Deimos. I'm not quite sure what that's on, on about there. Just funny how that's worded. On the 13th of August, 1898, Eros, the first near-Earth asteroid, is found by Carl Gustav Witt. And last date, there's more dates, but I'll leave them to later. The 17th of August, 1970, Soviet probe Verona 7 is launched to Venus and will send first pictures from the surface of another planet after landing on December 15. All right, this is VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with a regular Friday night broadcast and how the hour is moving along here. Sky Notes always takes a while to read through, <coughs> which doesn't worry me. It's all good. Okay, now let's see. This next article, courtesy of Sky and Telescope, is about a pulsar that has devoured enough of its stellar companion to grab the title of the most massive known neutron star. And there's a artist's impression of this star, neutron star here. Um, this artist's illustration shows a black widow pulsar and its companion star 
in the case of Pulsar or PSR J0952-0607, though, the companion appears to have given away most of its mass, making it a brown dwarf rather than a star. So that's just an artist's impression there. But nevertheless, going back to the article, and I'll just cut from that. Uh, it's the astronomical equivalent of an Olympic athlete winning a silver medal in one sport and a gold one in another. The Pulsar PSR J0952-0607, which is some 20,000 light years away in the constellation Sextons, already holds the title of second fastest known rotor, rotator spinning around its axis 707 times per second. Now, it has also shattered the record for most massive neutron star known, weighing in at 2.35 solar masses. Neutron stars are the city size, extremely compact leftovers of supernova explosions. Beams of high-energy particles and radiation from their magnetic poles sweep through space as they rotate. Depending on their orientation, we see some of them as pulsars, rapidly pulsating sources of radio waves and or X-rays. J0952 was discovered in December 2016 by Dutch radio astronomers Cies Basser and Ziggy Plunis and Jason Hessels none of whom were involved in the new study using the International Low Frequency Array, LOFAR, a European network of small radio antennas with its core in the Netherlands. The design of our search was biased towards finding neutron stars that are bright at low radio frequencies which are expected to be fast spinning, says Bassa. Indeed, PSR 0952 has a rotation period of a mere 1.91 millisecond, just shy of the 1.40 millisecond rate of the current record holder, PSR J1748. The surfaces of these objects whip around at some 20% 20 20 20 the speed of light. Hard to understand, but there it is. These millisecond pulsars spin up as they accrete material from an orbiting companion star. In some cases, the companion is slowly devoured, which is why objects like J0952 are also called Black Widow pulses, after the spider that first mates with and then eats her partner. The accumulating gas gradually beefs up the mass of the neutron star. The companion of J0952 has probably lost at least one solar mass to the pulsar, dwindling down to a substellar object of a few tenths of Jupiter's masses, a few tens of Jupiter masses. Pulsars that have accreted may be the most massive neutron stars that can be found in nature, Comet Cecil. However, determining their mass isn't straightforward, of course. A team led by Roger Romani, Stanford University, has now succeeded in taking spectra of the extremely faint 23rd magnitude companion of J0952 using the 10 meter Keck 1 telescope at Mauna Kea, Hawaii, in a study to appear in astrophysical journal letters, they report Doppler measurements indicating an orbital velocity of 380 kilometers per second, combined with brightness measurements over the orbital period of 6.42 hours. This yields a mass estimate for the neutron star of 2.35 solar masses. The previous record holder. Pulsar J0740 weighed in at just 2.08 solar masses. The result is important because no one knows how much matter behaves under the most extreme conditions. 
The interiors of neutron stars may consist of ordinary elementary particles or of completely new forms of matter. This so-called equation of state determines how massive a neutron star can get before it further collapses into a black hole. The mass estimate of J0952 is still quite uncertain, with a possible error of plus or minus 0.17 solar masses. Of course, we would like an even tighter mass me measurement of this especially, especially important system, Romani and his colleagues write. But improved radial velocity measurements like, likely await the 30 meter telescope error. According to Victoria Cuspy, McGill University, Canada, who was not involved in the study, the new result provides an important constraint, but it's still too early to draw definite conclusions about neutron star matter. He says, I think this result sends warning to, to modelers of ultra-dense matter that neutron stars may be capable of having pretty high masses, she says. If I were a theorist wedded to a model that permitted only lower mass neutron stars, I'd start scratching my head about now, though I wouldn't yet be in full panic mode, she says. So you have to be a scientist that studies pulsars to understand all that. <laughs> anyway, you're tuned to VK3EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Let's move along now. And this one's got a few pictures here associated with the International Space Station. So let me just bring those images up that I've saved. Don't be a pest. Thank you. Alrighty then. Russia. Russia's withdrawal from the ISS could mean an early demise of the orbital lab. The head of the Russian Space Agency announced that the country will withdraw from the International Space Station after 2024. A space policy expert explains what this means and why it's happening now. Russia intends to withdraw from the International Space Station after 2024, according to an announcement from Yuri Bo Borisov, the new head of Russian Space Agency. Ros Rosso Cosmos, in a meeting with Vladimir Putin, on July 26, 2022, Borisov also said future efforts will focus on a new Russian space station. Current agreements on the International Space Station have it operating through 2024 and the station needs Russian modules to stay in orbit. The US and its partners have been seeking to extend the station's life to 2030. Russia's announcement while not a breach of any agreement or an immediate threat to the station's daily operation, does mark the accumulation of months of political tensions involving the International Space Station. Over its 23 light year, <laughs> sorry, over its 23 year lifetime, the station has been an important example of how Russia and the US can work together despite formal being former adversaries. This cooperation has been especially significant as the country's relationship has deteriorated in recent years. While it remains unclear whether Russians will follow through this announcement, it does add significant stresses to the operation of the most successful international cooperation in space ever. As, the solar, as a scholar who studies space policy, I think the question now is whether the, pol the, the policy, sorry, whether the political relationship has gotten so bad that working together in space becomes impossible. And there's another image here of the station I can bring up. So, and this this partic particular picture you're seeing there is the uh, Z Zvezda Zvezda module at the far bottom left in the photo is one of six Russian segments of the International Space Station and houses the engines used to keep the station in orbit. So what would this withdrawal look like? Russia operates six of the 17 modules 
on the IWS, including the Zvezda, which houses the main engine system. This engine is vital to the station's ability to remain in orbit and also to how it moves out of the way of dangerous space debris. Under the International Space Agreements, International Space Station Agreements, Russia retains full control and legal authority over its modules. It is certainly unclear how Russia's withdrawal will play out. Russia's announcement speaks only to after 2024. Additionally, Russia did not say whether it would allow the International Space Station partners to take control of Russian modules and continue to operate the station or whether it would require that the modules be shut down completely. Given that the Russian modules are necessary to station's operations, it's uncertain whether the station would be able to operate without them. It's also unclear whether it would be possible to separate the Russian module from the eats from the rest of the IWS, as the entire station was designed to be interconnected. Depending on how and when Russia decides to pull out of the station, partner countries will have to make tough choices about whether to deorbit the International Space Station altogether or to find creative solutions to keep it in the sky. And there's one more picture here. These guys. <clears throat> the announcement uh, of the withdrawal is the latest in a series of events concerning the IWS and have occurred since Russia first invaded Ukraine in February. Russia's decision to leave should not have a significant effect on daily functions of the IWS. Like a number of minor incidents that have happened over the previous month, it is more of a political action. The first incident, oh this picture by the way, um, it's up on the screen now. Um, <laughs> This is the subtitle in this for this picture. NASA accused Russia of staging an anti-Ukrainian propaganda photo on the IWS after Russian space agency posted this photo of three cosmonauts holding a flag of the uh, Luhansk People's Republic. I don't know if they pronounce that right. Luhansk, Luhansk, whatever. Anyway, that's uh, it's one of those pictures that's probably uh, got a few. Uh, Feathers ruffled, I'd say. <sighs> Politics, I tell you. Anyway, let's get rid of that picture. Um, back to me, that'll do. Alrighty then. So, to finish this article, and quickly, uh, I'll go to that last paragraph. It's unclear why Russia made the announcement now. Tensions surrounding the International Space Station have been high since Russia's involvement with Ukraine began in February. At the time, uh, Dmitry Rogzin, uh, then head of Roscosmos, insinuated that Russia's leaving the International Space Station might be a possibility. However, uh, Rosgin was recently fired and NASA and Roscosmos announced a sweet swap for the International Space Station. A seat swap, not a sweet swap, a seat swap. Under this deal, an, an American astronaut would launch to the station on a future Soyuz mission while a cosmonaut would launch on a upcoming Space X Dragon launch. The two moves together suggested that the two sides might still be able to find ways to work together in space, but it seems though impressions were misleading. The announcement also comes as the US is considering the future beyond the International Space Station. NASA is currently in the first phase of development of a commercial space station as a replacement for the orbiting lab. While accelerating the development of this new space station would be difficult, it does signal that the International Space Station is nearly the end of its productive and inspirational life, no matter what Russia does. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3EKH, and talking about uh, things falling from space. <clears throat> and I've got a picture here of this one. Uh, we are over here. Okay. I think we've seen that image a few dozen times by now. Uncontrolled debris from China, space rocket could crash back to Earth as soon as Saturday, July 29. 
Uncontrolled debris from a Chinese rocket could come crashing back to Earth as soon as Saturday, according to the Aerospace Corporation, a federally funded space research centre that tracks orbital debris re-entry. China launched a new laboratory module called the Wintern uh, for its uh, Tiangong Space Station from Henning Island in South China Sea early this week. The rocket carrying the module, the Long March 5B, will make an uncontrolled re-entry. This isn't the first time rocket debris from China's space program has plunged through the atmosphere with an air of suspense. In May 2021, the world watched with uncertainty as it tried to determine whether the remains of a rocket of the same class carrying the initial module for the Tiangong space station would crash. After years of tense monitoring by scientists and various agencies, including United States Space Command, the rocket re-entered the atmosphere over the Indian Ocean. Now, a replica, situ- a rep- replica situation is at hand. The rocket, China largest, the rocket China's largest measures roughly 175 feet and weighs 23 metric tonnes. According to the Aerospace Corporation, it is much too early to tell exactly where it will fall. U.S. Space Command said in a statement that last year's rocket re-entry location could not be pinpointed until within hours of the re-entry. An agency spokesperson told CNN it is monitoring space debris from this week's launch. But experts emphasise that risk to people generally, and to the United States of course, is extremely low. We estimate that the that basically only 3% of the ground track is over the US. Generally, space agencies try to guide the re-entry of rockets over certain size, of certain size to ensure they land somewhere that poses no threat to people, according to the Director of Aerospace Corporation Centre. It, if, an, if an object has a 1 in 10,000 chance of impacting an area where it could hurt somebody, NASA will try to control its re-entry. It's fundamentally a low-risk thing, but it's way higher than it ought to be. It's 10 times higher than our thresholds. A re-entry debris expert uh, working with the Aerospace Corporation said, but in fact, well, but the fact that we that we're having this conversation, the fact that people are out there tracking it and watching it is unnecessary is, is an unnecessary thing. Even if nothing happens, people being ready in case something happens has costs. NASA has rebuked China's space agency in the past for its allowance of uncontrolled re-entries. It is clear that China is failing to meet responsible standards uh, regarding the space debris, said NASA's administrator Bill Nielsen in a statement according following the re-entry of last week's rocket debris. So, <coughs> this now goes and segues to a very interesting little article that's very, very current. Um, and uh, let me see if I can bring up, well, for the first let's go to the article. I'm going to have to quickly go here. Um, space junk potentially found in New South Wales snowy mountain paddocks. And this is about um, a few hours ago. <coughs> uh, a large piece of debris found in the middle of a sheep paddock could be space junk from SpaceX mission and linked it to a large bang heard across the region earlier this month. Many of those heard the bang on July 9 took to social media to report it across the snowy mountains in southern New South Wales and as far away as Albury, Wagga Wagga and Canberra. Speculation was rife that it may have been caused by SpaceX Dragon spacecraft re-entering Earth's atmosphere after it launched in November 2020. Mick Miners, who runs a sheep station, farm at uh, Numbula Vale, N- Numbula Vale, south of Jindabyne, stumbled across an almost three metre high object wedged into a remote part of his paddock on Monday. He says, I didn't know what to think. I had no idea what it was, he said. After the discovery, he called neighbour farmer Jock Wallace, who also found some mysterious debris nearby. I didn't hear the bang, but my daughter said it was very loud. He says, I think it's a concern it's just fallen out of the sky. If it landed on your house, it would make a hell of a mess, he reckons. 
After contacting the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, Mr Wallace said that he was told to contact the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in the United States. Uh, he says, I'm a farmer from Delgetti from... Uh, what I'm, what am I going to say to NASA, he says. <laughs> anyway, I've got some pictures here of this uh, debris, uh, which I'll uh, bring up on the camera. There it is, as part of it there. Um, in fact, uh, I'll... Uh, that, uh, what is the image I've got up here? That's that one there. Okay. That's... Uh, what The guy there in the picture is Jock Wallace, and he's hol he holds what is believed to be space junk found on his sheep farm. Uh, so that's uh, that's good old Jock. It's an Aussie name, that one, I guess. Uh, so uh, one of the pieces found on the property contained serial numbers and Australian National <coughs> University College of Science astrophysicist Brad Tucker said that the debris was almost likely to, to come from an unpressurised crew trunk of the craft, he reckons. He said it was possible for the large pieces of document documented debris in Australia since NASA's Skylab space station came plummeting back to Earth uh, over Esperance in Western Australia 1979. A large oxygen tank from the station was later found uh, in 1993, hundreds of kilometres away from Esperance. And uh, I've got uh, some, there's plenty of pictures here really. Uh, this is uh, another shot here. And uh, the guy in the shorts is Brad Tucker, astrophysicist Brad Tucker, who we often hear on the see in the media. Uh, or seven seven four. <coughs> Doctor Tucker said that the craft was likely travelling at twenty five thousand kilometres per hour uh, at the time of reentry, and the debris was was likely linked to the widely heard bang on July nine. He said it was likely made of carbon and aluminium comp composites. He said recent reports predicted that there was a 10% chance someone on Earth would be hit by space junk this decade. A big piece of metal falling from the sky is never going to end well, he said. Dr. Tucker said that there is also concern over the uncontrolled return to Earth of Chinese booster rocket over coming days, just to talk, which is what I just talked about, which was being monitored by United States. Swinburne University of Technology astronomer Rebecca Allen also confirmed Dr. Tucker's analysis of the parts, saying it appeared to be pieces of rocket fairing. Um, the Microgravity Experimentation Space Technology and Indu Industry Institute program leader said that the debris had been tracked to southeast New South Wales. And there's just another shot here uh, of Brad Tucker looking all very chuffed. And uh, this shows that although most of it's supposed to burn up in the atmosphere, large pieces just don't. This is quite worrying and shows it is critical to track debris. Uh, there could even be issues where it's, it's damaging the ozone layer, so we need to do more research in this area. SpaceX has been contacted for a comment, as in a comment. So there it is, Brad Tucker on the screen there, with uh, standing next to this bit of space junk that survived re-entry. That looks like it's a pretty weighty piece of space junk, and I reckon if that uh, it was aiming for um, for your house, it would definitely penetrate the roof, one way or another. All right, spaceweather.com. Let's stream to that. Ah, uh, dear me. Um, where am I here? VMix. I did have VMix up. Let me just go back to VMix and bring up moi and uh and now uh space no that's it um where are we all right, right got it oh god they spilt my coffee all over me it's truth okay the solar wind is uh at 325.7 kilometers a second it's a gale at a density of 7.05 protons per cubic centimeter there are four sunspots on the disk of the sun as we speak. And I can bring up that picky. Is it? How's that look? It doesn't look very high res, does it? Anyway, um, okay. So, 
Uh, yeah, right. So the current sunspot number is 50. The radio sun is at 93 solar flux units, so that's come down a bit. 93 solar flux units measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters. Um, the new sunspot AR3068, which is not on that uh, disk of the sun there, but they say a new sunspot AR3068 near the sun's southeastern limb is still small. They haven't got even on that map there. But it merits watching as possible source of near future activity solar flare alerts. Okay. Uh, okay, so the next image is. Uh, and did I. No, I didn't save it. Okay, I thought I did. Um, let me just see if I can find it um, very quickly. This is the current view of the Aurora. Australis over the South Pole. Okay, so although there is a ring of activity, it's pretty normal and average. Um, nothing to write home about. So there's a, a little bit of activity stretching out towards New Zealand and Tasmania right now as we speak, but it's not uh, not a whole lot to be too concerned about right now. So, um, back to the live camera. I've got so many slides open here. All right. So, on that note, I think I shall conclude the broadcast for tonight. Um, and as of the 29th of July, there was 2,285 potentially hazardous asteroids. Okay, <laughs> and um, there's a couple of other little articles there, but I'll leave them. Actually, it was just really the one I, I couldn't get to tonight. It would have taken me a little while to get through, but I'll leave it till next week. It's quite colourful, really. Um, so I'll leave that till uh, next Friday. So this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. I'll just have a quick look at the inbox. And look at that, the usual three amigos sending me emails. Uh, we've got uh, an email from, just wake up, waking up the mouse. Um, we've got an email from Don, VK3HDX, and he reports uh, good signals as normal, 35 on 80 and 30 on 160. YouTube pictures look great. Have a good broadcast. Yes, I think I have. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Uh, we also have an email from uh, VK3AIF. G'day, Dave. He says um, I'm he's listening and watching again on YouTube. No RTV coverage here still tonight. Um, must get around to building and setting up that antenna. Yeah, do that, mate. Do that. I'm sure you'll 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 see RTV. And one from Andrew VK3KIS. He says listening on 80 meters in good old Ringwood. So, yep, thanks, Andrew. Excellent stuff. So, any, like I say, any any reports, by all means, send to vk3ekh at gmail.com. Now, just a quick look at uh, who was on the uh, the chat window here. Uh, it looks like we've got a little bit of uh, a little bit of activity here that I haven't been paying attention to. Um, but we've had Richard vk3vrs, Martin vk7jh. Graham, VK3GRK, Mitch, VK3 Zulu Tango, g'day Mitch, down at Evanlock, and uh, Bruce, VK3 Mike November, g'day Bruce, no doubt watching TV as well, and he's talking about meteors here. This is the, I think this is the one that was on the, the news tonight, uh, a triple meteoric spectacle, spect spectacle is set to grace our skies this weekend. Looking for something spectacular to brighten a cold, dark winter's night? Well, this weekend might be just must might just have something in store. Not one, not two, but three meteor showers active at the same time, combining to provide a celestial firework display almost all the night. So yes, they mentioned that tonight in the news. And the Sky Notes didn't have it though. Strange enough. Anyway, there it is. Um, 
and Steve VK3 SPX uh, photo of Proxima Centauri okay he's uh, inserted an image here and Martin's reporting noise levels have gone high gone up on 80 shall see how I go <laughs> so there it is that's the sort of stuff you see on our chat window so you can easily join that little chat window and say g'day as well That cup of coffee lasts me an hour. You know, I came up at 10 o'clock with that, and that was the last little bit cool at the end there, but there it is. All right, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. We shall conclude our medium wave service on 1865 kilohertz now. Um, we shall resume transmissions on 80 for the callback. Stations on 80 meters, please stand by. This is VK3 EKH with VK3 CSJ on the microphone concluding our AM service on 160. Thank you for listening and uh, we'll be back again at next Friday to do it again. Uh, we do this on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria so more information about the society can be found at www.asv.org.au. <clears throat> and uh, information about the station, just go to qrz.com and type in VK3 EKH or VK3 CSJ for what it's worth. This is VK3 EKH concluding transmission on 160. Please stand by for 400 hertz tone. Oh, I'm not going to do that. It'll be just dead air for a second. Anyway, cheers everybody listening on AM there. Okay, so that's 160 finished and uh, all very quiet noise floor not that quiet noise floor is about 15 over 9 all right <laughs> I feel funny tonight don't know why anyway all right let's get to a new clean piece of paper and let me see who is on 80 meters that wants to call him so this is VK3 EKH listening on 3541 kilohertz. Go ahead. There's a few weaker stations there. Uh, I've got VK3 BDA, VK3 HDX, VK2 Alpha Alpha Victor. Uh, there were some weaker stations that doubled. Uh, try again. Sounds like the band conditions have fallen over. Uh, VK3JR, I think that was you there, uh, Frank. There was another VK2, I think. VK2 Mike Alpha. Uh, just come back again. No, there was another station there. It might have been, might have been a VK3. Uh, I think it had Mike Alpha in it or something like that. VK2 or VK3 Mike Alpha. Uh, I think it's the phonetics I, uh, letters I heard. Try again. Okay, VK3 Mike Alpha Papa. I think it was VK3 MAP was that last one. So here I go again, I'm writing over and over and makes a mess of my writing here. So we've got VK3 BDA, VK3 HDX, VK2 AAV, VK3 MAP and VK3 JR. Is there anybody else? No, you both double chaps. Try <laughs> Just try again. Okay, VK3 uh, SPX and VK3 BSE. Fantastic. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Beautiful little loop. All right. 
to the top of the list, Graham, VK3 BDA, but Bendigo, have a say, mate, VK3 EKH. Oops, wrong one. Yeah, thanks, Graham. <coughs> VK two, uh, VK three, BDA Bendigo, VK three, EKH replying. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Graham, for uh, for calling in. And um, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's um, uh, the um, the amount of tracking that they've uh, the way they track these objects is uh, is quite um, uh, quite amazing. Um, but um, I, I I wonder if there's actually a um, uh, kind of a, a world uh, network of these uh, radar stations. Um, I, I know that they can predict where these objects are uh, to some degree through computer uh, programming, um, but to, to to know where these objects are, especially these rogue devices or rogue parts that um, uh, that uh, are due to uh, re-enter, uh, they, they must must have some sort of ability to. Uh, to track those, and uh, America can't continue to track those objects if they're over the horizon. So they must have other uh, systems in place to uh, to track these objects. So um, interesting to know exactly how it's done. I reckon that would make a very good National Geographic documentary. Um, <laughs> thanks, Graham. Excellent to hear you, um, Don VK3 HDX VK3 EKH. Good evening, sir. Good on you, Don. VK3 HDX, VK3 EKH. Thank you very much, Lee. And um, <coughs> I uh, always rely on the, the signal report uh, and audio report. So, uh, all very good indeed. Um, now, the next fellow, I don't know if I have a name for you. Um, sorry if I should know it, but I'm not too certain. VK2 Alpha Alpha Victor, VK3 EKH. Go ahead. Good 
Yeah, good on you, Steve. VK two AAV, VK three EKH returning. Yeah, thanks, Steve. It's um, if I go back in my logbook, so I'll probably find your call sign there for sure. Uh, <laughs> my, my logbook is just a, a notepad which uh, I use the the back of both uh, pieces of paper as I progress through them. So. And I make a right mess of it sometimes. Yeah, we're still doing it, Steve. Um, it's it's been a few years. Um, the, uh, the 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 broadcast has been going since uh, 1988, and uh, uh, of course you we had uh, Russell uh, Russell Ward uh, who manned the the station uh, for 20 years. Um, VK3 DRW. G'day to Russell if you're listening there. Um, and then I took over. I think I think it was about 2008. Can't remember exactly, but it was uh, around about then. Uh, so I've uh, I've been on the mic now for um, a good 12 years or so. But um, yeah, we'll continue to uh, to write, keep doing it, I suppose, until I drop dead, something like that. Uh, <laughs> the uh, and because uh, <coughs> I'm expanding the the field now, because I'm also on YouTube. You'll you'll see this the video stream uh, on my YouTube channel, VK3 CSJ, and uh, also simulcast on 160 AM uh, on 1865, and uh, also broadcasting through the Melbourne Television Repeater, uh, VK3 RTV, which uh, also has links to uh, the British Amateur Radio Society website, or BATC British Amateur Television Club. They have a, a video server that the repeater links to. I haven't checked to see if that's working actually, but usually it does. And uh, and um, uh, yeah, and of course there's the uh, email vk3ekh at uh, gmail.com. So uh, yeah, it's, I've expanded out a little bit over these years, <laughs> but. Um, Every now and then we try to, to make it sound a little bit interesting rather than uh, just the, the usual reading of articles. So I'm a bit overdue for a, a podcast or something like that that I can play, which I, I might do in the near future. Anyway, uh, good to hear, Steve. Thanks for calling in. Uh, not a bad signal from you, too. You're 5 or 9 plus 15 to, uh, to 20. Uh, Brody, I think it is. VK3MAP. I think it's the first time for you, maybe, perhaps, possibility. VK3MAP, VK3EKH. Yeah, excellent uh, stuff, uh, Brody. VK3 M M A P VK3 E K H returning. It's a nice station. I'm looking at your station on QRZ.com, and uh, well, it's tidy. Let's say that much. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> completely different to my station at the moment, but uh, no, it's <clears throat> it's a very neat little uh, setup you've got there, uh, Brody, and um, you're not uh, not doing too bad uh, signal coming up from, um, uh, where is it, uh, Dales, Dalston. Very good indeed. Yeah, I know Mitch is li listening in the background, Mr. ZT. G'day, Mitch. So, um, uh, not a problem there at all. Good to meet you, Brady. Thanks for uh, popping up. And uh, like I said, we're, we're here every Friday, uh, although there is a, a Friday coming up very soon. I think it's towards the uh, the end of this month. Around, I think it's around about the 20th of uh, August. 
Uh, let me just check that. Friday, Friday, 22nd, I think it is. I think it's the 22nd, 22nd or 23rd uh, um, of August. We've got the um, the ATV QSO party, so I, I won't be on Friday that night. I'll be in, involved with the TV system, uh, but uh, we'll mention that the Friday before. Um, thanks, Brady. Uh, now, I think there was Frank there. VK3JR, VK3EKH. Thanks, Frank. VK3 JR, VK3 EKH. Yeah, signal's a bit weaker than normal, uh, but quite comparable. Managed to uh, to hear uh, most of what you were saying without problem. So, uh, but you're pretty much five or nine, uh, picking uh, probably five to ten over, but averaging five or nine. So, um, note the weaker the weaker signal. Okay, not a problem there, uh, Frank. And. Uh, I don't know whether Mr. SL will be up on 160 later. Um, not sure if you mentioned that, but anyway, um, I'll be looking out for his carrier coming up on 160 if he does come up. Anyway, thanks, Frank, and uh, good to hear you. Um, Steve, VK3 Sugar Papa X Ray, VK3 EKH. Good day, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Steve. VK3 SPX, <coughs> VK3 EKH. Well, that's impressive. I um, uh, you, you may have mentioned it. I I, I can't recall, but uh, uh, yes, I, I 
I, I gather then you must have a, a your own telescope and observatory set up and uh, and uh, and all that sort of thing. Is that correct? Okay. <laughs> you need to send us some pictures of that. <laughs> I'll be interested to see uh, uh, what you've uh, what you've got set up. I um, I've uh, I've got a uh, Celestron um, a eight hundred um, a um, yeah Celestron eight hundred XLT um, which uh, I'm hoping to uh, uh, get into a. Uh, an observatory, uh, either uh, build one or uh, get a dome. I'm, I'm still weighing up what to do in that area, but I'm so keen to uh, to do some astrophotography. <laughs> but before I do that, I really need to uh, to get the telescope set up so that it's um it's going. I can just open up the door, roll back the roof, or open up the dome, whatever, and uh, and and really start using the telescope thoroughly. Um, it, it it annoys me to have to, uh, to to drag things out to the uh, to the backyard and um, you know and then bring it all back in at the end of the night. Uh, so um, uh, I, I really really would love to get into uh, doing uh, uh, observing, um, you know, with the, with the aid of a, an observatory. So uh, uh, I'm still like I say I'm still making up my mind whether to uh, to go with a roll off roof concept or uh, or a dome. Uh, I'd like a dome, preferably. It's that's traditional. <laughs> but anyway, we'll see. Anyway, that's impressive, and uh, I, I do appreciate uh, the effort that you've taken to get that image. Um, you know, I'll be keen to do the same thing. You know, so uh, uh, that's pretty good. For those watching ATV, uh, that I, I can't bring it up on the screen right now because it's on the other computer. Uh, but that the where I'm pointing to on the screen here is this uh, photograph that uh, Steve is referring to, and um, I don't know if my USB camera can get over there. Let's see if it, how far it'll reach. Um, just bringing up my USB camera so I can get close to this picture on the screen. So that that's that's the picture, Steve's picture of. Uh, of Proxima Centauri. Now, again, it's very hard to see on the camera because I can't get any closer to the screen. <coughs> but uh, it's still pretty good. Um, yeah, most impressive. So, uh, all very good. Oh, apologies for the camera movement. It's so unprofessional. <laughs> oh dear. Thanks, Steve. Okay, John VK3BSE. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you've called him before either. Anyway, VK3 BSC, VK3 EKH. Uh, 
Thanks, John, VK3BSE, VK3EKH. You know, it's the one thing that I haven't seen yet is the uh, Leon Musk uh, satellites that go zipping across the sky, um, when, certainly when they've, they've just been released um, uh, from, uh, from their docking arrangement in space, and, and they, they take on this, these uh, uh, pearled you know, like a bunch of pearls going across the sky. Uh, I've heard reports, there's been a, a number of uh, people that I've spoken to, even here on the radio, uh, that have said to me, oh, I saw the SpaceX uh, uh, deployment of satellites go across uh, the sky this morning. And that would be something to see. I mean, as, a, as a, uh, an astronomer, um, both optical and, and radio, <laughs> um, uh, speaking on behalf of them at least, uh, we are a little bit sensitive on that SpaceX business going on because they've now they've now deployed thousands of these satellites um, and it's really co- uh, contributing to sky pollution uh, both in the optical and the RF side of it. In fact, a lot of professional radio astronomers are getting their noses out of joint, uh, but to keep the peace, they're... Um, They've uh, uh, sat down with Leon Musk and and the, and the engineers to uh, to come up with a way of mitigating the possible interference issue with um, with these satellites. <coughs> but uh, it is uh, becoming a, a more of a serious thing, uh, being able to do astronomy from Earth, from the surface of the Earth, and uh, you know if you're a, if you're an astrophotographer. Uh, you you can record these satellites going over and, and capture some um, amazing streaks across the sky, um, but uh, of course it's uh, it all depends on the how, what time because if you, uh, if you if 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 you've got the sun glinting off these uh, objects then yes you're going to to capture them in, in your frame, uh, but once the sun goes down um, then these satellites aren't if there's no light reflecting off them then there's not a, not really an issue. So uh, depends on the time of the day, but uh, yeah, I, I've yet to see the uh, the chain of satellites going across the sky. But I'll uh, I'll catch up with that one day. <laughs> I'm sure there'll, there'll be uh, uh, another launch of satellites very soon to be able to catch a hold of that. Anyway, thanks, John. Um, you're um, I, I'd love to give you a signal report, but my changeover relay in my linear amplifier has locked on now it's been pretty good uh, but I got to Steve uh, VK3 SPX and the relay decided to uh, to lock in so uh, the antenna isn't being patched to my receiver I've got to fix that at some point <laughs> anyway all right thanks uh, gentlemen I'll, I'll just give one more call to see if anybody else wants to check in VK3 EKH listing for any other stations <laughs> nothing heard so uh, I shall say a very pleasant good evening to everybody who's called in tonight. <coughs> uh, to uh, Graham, Don, Steve, Brady, Frank, Steve, John. Sounds like uh, a song. Um, <laughs> and uh, to everybody who's uh, called in there on the email and the Discord uh, chat, chat room, uh, Martin, VK7JH. Thanks uh, for checking in there, Martin. And uh, I don't see uh, um, Kim, vk 5 fuse he's not there tonight. No, Bruce VK three MN. Thanks for for listening in there. Um, the Delta Aquarids, Aquarids. Is that what they are? Um, and of course uh, Richard too, and Graham and Mitch, Mr ZT. Thanks, uh, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, have a safe week. Stay warm, and uh, we'll see you next Friday at ten o'clock to do it all again. So this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast concluding transmissions for tonight. Thank you very much for watching and listening and um, we'll see you next week. Uh, yeah, this is VK3 EKH concluding. Bye. Oh, look, not a problem. Um, 
I think I heard you um, tuning in uh, before too, um, a little bit uh, around about 9.30 or so, really, really super high audio quality. Um, it's a, I can tell you got that nice uh, nice microphone on. Um, oh, damn it. <laughs> Hang on a second, I'm just doing something here. Um, that's it. Just, uh, yeah, right. Just making sure that I've got that. Oh, it's the uh, the stream on my YouTube. I've got a... If I, if I don't keep tabs with that, I'll um, I'll, I'll keep my bloody, the, the the video stream on YouTube will just continue to go. Um, I've, I've got to keep an eye on it. I've got so so many pages open. Anyway, all right. Thanks, Brett, uh, for tuning in. And uh, yeah, good signal from you. And um, um, make sure you listen on time next week. Okay. <laughs> no, she's okay. Thanks, Brett. Vk okay, three. Um. Um. Uh, um AOB VK3 CSJ. Cheers, mate. Take care. VK3 EKH with VK3 CSJ is concluding. All right. On that basis, I shall uh, conclude the stream. Uh, as well now that I can see that it's on still so <laughs> uh, thank you for watching everybody on YouTube and um, to my vast millions of people that watch so <laughs> anyway catch us all later uh, next Friday we will be doing a uh, the WIA broadcast the Wireless Institute of Australia broadcast at 10.30 on Sunday morning if the repeater is working and also following that is the old timers net uh, broadcast too so um, that should be um, an interesting one to run as well thanks Richard for uh, being there in the background if you still are in the background and I should turn that down and I can see Steve has come up on 160 all right, this is VK3 EKH Acker VK3 CSJ concluding on the YouTube stream. Cheers, everybody up there on the stream. And I'll, um, I'll just go to color bars first. Hang on a sec. Do it nice and professionally.